Uh, yeah, it's really good to be speaking. Um, I really, really like SIMAP. We've used it for a lot of different things, um, some conventional, some not so conventional, um, and this talk uh, covers both types. Uh, just as a, a little bit of introduction. Um, <coughs> environment Systems, we're an environmental consultancy um, where we sort of interface between the environment um, and the systems to analyse it. Uh, we're trusted providers of evidence and insight uh, to governments and industry. Um, this talks very much about government go governments um, and these are the places in the work world where we work. So this talks about Wales, where you all know where that is, Centralina and some of the Caribbean overseas territories. We also have this always on accessible data insights from satellite observations. Have to get that one in. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to cover, I'm going to start by doing, I've got four techie slides for the techies amongst us, um, which I thought you might be interested in, something that caught me out. Uh, and then I'm going to look at Wales, St Helena and the overseas territories. So the first question is, what do our policy makers require? And actually, they need evidence and they need um, insight into pressures that are on the land to make good decisions so they need to know where the environment's working well how we can avoid serious issues and where the best place to site new developments and SIMAP's great because it's one of those things that you can put a map of the erosion risk and people get it the policy makers understand it um, and they can see um, immediately that that's giving them evidence that they can go to take to developers and other people to help um, with their land use policies these are my slightly techy slides because normally policies at a country or at least a region scale. Um, so what effect does scale have, particularly on the key SIMAP impact inputs of the DTM and vegetation map? Um, of course, rainfall will have an impact as well. So looking at DTMs, um, if you've got the free DTM, you, you, the SRTM is a 30 metre posting, 15 metre vertical. It's okay if you're doing really big scale things and want to know the really big risks. Um, but there are other satellite products that are out there now um, that are working at different scales that are actually quite useful. And then you get to airborne li LIDAR and at the very fine scale you can use drones. Um, and uh, it's very tempting when you're working at a country scale to buy the cheapest or use free data because... You're working at a country scale, but actually it's the sort of problem that you're investigating uh, should drive your data choice. Um, so this is an erosion channel. I don't know if you can see it um, on the island of Anguilla, which is carrying polluted water onto a coral reef offshore. Um, more on that later. Um, and if you're looking at that scale, actually using SRTM is going to be completely useless. Whereas if you're on the island of Montserrat, and this is a three-day rainfall event that completely destroyed one of their roads, I mean, you might have more of a chance with the free data. Um, two digital terrain models from satellite imagery I thought you might be interested in are the World DEM, which was from Airbus Defence and Space, and the ALOS prison mission AW3D. Um, the World DEM has an accuracy, quoted accuracy, is 12 metres of horizontal process. Posting, so that means it's got a measurement every 12 metres with a 2 to 4 metre vertical accuracy. Um, the ALOS prison quotes a 5 metre horizontal posting and a 5 metre accuracy. And when you first see that, it's very tempting to think the ALOS prison is going to give you a better result for using with um, SIMAP. But actually, because the World DEM is a radar model, so it's pinged and it actually measures the height as an actual physical ping measurement um, as a radar data um, and the um, ALOS prism is actually photogrammetry um, so they're taking photos at different times and you know like you used to do with the old air photos when you were trying to look at them in stereo pairs um, and then they strip the vegetation out so this is a little comparison this is a transect um, from the seashore inland um, and we walk that transect with a differential GPS which is the black line. So that's to two centimetre accuracy. So we're fairly certain about that. Um, World DEM tracks it very nicely. The, um, a, the ALOS PRISM data set, much less certainly. So do not be lulled 
into false promises of detail from photogrammetric products, you're almost always better going for um, a radar or LIDAR type product. Just a little hand, um, hint because that's something that caught me out. So case studies. In Wales, the policy environment in Wales has changed a lot in the last um, four or five years with two key pieces of legislation, the Environment Wales Act 2016 and the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act 2015 that have put environment very firmly um, right there in um, its, its preservation and its importance right there for the Welsh Government um, policy. And... Um, it's, it's kind of the 25-year plan in England, but set in legislation forever. So it really is quite significant. National Resources Wales have been working out how they're going to build these two pieces of legislation into their um, solutions to maximise the value for green growth, resource efficiency, environmental resilience and improving community and well-being. And they did this in several stages. So the first stage was um, the state of nature... Na natural resources report uh, which was a high level document looking at the whole of Wales then they came down to looking at six regions of Wales to do these area statements um, which is um, where this um, case study comes in but encouragingly enough Welsh Government are now drafting another piece of legislation which is the National Development Framework which is going to be the overarching legislation um, about land use planning in Wales and they're also interested in this data <coughs> Um, to actually be included as examples in high-level policy for land use planning, uh, which is the first time in Wales, which is really exciting. Um, and there is a chance that we might get a sign up map in either that document or the evidence that feeds it. So that's really good going. For the GIS for area statements, um, we looked at five key um, areas and food and the ones with the red circles round are the ones that we used SIMAP um, to help us with. So apologies for the slightly fuzzy photo. This is natural flood management measures to slow down water to increase time out of flood effects. Um, and um, the idea here was we used the flow paths of SIMAP um, and their position in the catchment to model where the biggest opportunities for planting woodland would be to help um, slow flooding. So at the top of your catchment, planting woodlands isn't really going to do much. It's not the right sort of place to do things. At the bottom of the catchment, where you're already in the floodplains, um, you need a different type of um, catchment. But actually here in the mid-catchment, where you've got these very flashy areas, um, you know, with flat valley bottoms and drainage channels, this is where NFM has its maximum impact. Um, so we've done maps for Wales to show uh, these areas of woodland planting. Um, you might wonder what a sensitive, sensitive area is. This is in Wales there are acid sensitive catchments um, and there's legislation that says you've got to only plant certain trees in acid sensitive catchments but it doesn't say you mustn't plant trees um, which is an important distinction. Sorry to interrupt you there. We've had quite a live discussion recently in Natural England about the use of these wooden layers, such as the one the Natural Processes one, almost giving people a carte blanche to plant trees, but there may actually be a more appropriate natural habitat to put in there. So um, this is part of a data set um, which has got 20 different opportunity layers, and the idea is that they take it out to the community and the stakeholder groups as an evidence to talk through with stakeholders these are not meant to be prescriptive tools at all. They're meant to be the evidence base. Be the, the Environment Act very much wanted to start at the ground and build up rather than be very directive. And CCW always had better data available and their range of habitat than the habitat. Yes, actually. yeah. So the habitat map for Wales is very detailed. Yeah, yeah. Water quality, needn't say any more, really. That's where SIMAP came from. So SIMAP channels, erosion risk. Um, Obviously, it would have been really nice if we'd had this latest um, implementation. As we didn't, um, we just took a very simplistic approach. Where we've got pasture and no habitat boundary to the river, so no rough grassland um, or hedge, um, then we called it high risk for <coughs> fetal coliform and sediment. Where we had arable with no boundary, 
that's vegetation boundary to a river, then you know, you've got looking at agrochemical and sediment risks. Um, it was most, and, and that kind of we lumped in nutrient status as well, mostly pea in the sediment, phosphorus in the sediment coming off in Wales. Um, and we use the network index as well as channels and the distance to rivers and the land use. And we were able to do that in Wales because we have got data sets on hedges. Um, that's an example of the same area with, with that planting. So um, this is where you could plant different types of um, habitat um, and in these channels to help reduce pollution so it's very much targeted at where pollution might be of course now we've got better layer we could do it even better because we can use the old pollution hotspots. Going on to the food example um, do most of you know the agricultural land classification? So um, uh, that's um, uh, the way of describing uh, the best and most versatile land in um, England and Wales and uh, there's been a project by Welsh Government over the last few years to update the agricultural land classification to split um, grade three into best and most versatile, which is 3A, which is suitable for growing a number of crops, and 3B, which is only really suitable for growing um, uh, cereal crops um, and pasture. Uh, and they did this by getting all the data that had been submitted to them um, from different surveys and building it into the soil map. So this now is a map of uh, best and most versatile land in Wales. It's a fantastic data set because the attribute table actually tells you for each individual bit of land why it's failing, it's too stony, it's too steep. Um, so you've got all that soil data now to work with in Wales, which is a tremendous advantage. Um, showed this to the planners with the NDF and they said oh, it would be rather nice if we knew with that best and most versatile land what sort of erosion risk might be there. So this is the erosion risk um, for Wales um, on the best and most versatile land and um, you know this is a, a zoom in to show you that actually some of the best soils in Wales which as you can see by the large amount of white is a very very scarce um, and uh, yeah, permanent resource. If you if you trash it, it's gone forever. Um, some of it is at erosion risk, and this area here is particularly important. It's where we get our Pembrokeshire early potatoes from, and one of the most important cash crops um, in the area. So interesting stuff. Maybe it'll go in. Maybe it won't. We'll wait and see. But it's really good to have this sort of issue being considered not just in the environment. <coughs> But in the well-being and community legislation and now in the development um, legislation, it, it just is very encouraging to work on. Complete change in case study two. We've now moved to the middle of the South Atlantic, to the island of St Helena. Some of you might know St Helena as the place where Napoleon was um, banished to at the end of the Napoleonic Wars because it was the most difficult place on earth to get to. It's kind of still pretty bad, even though they've got an airport. Um, <laughs> but in those days, it must have been quite awful. Our, our, this was a Darwin Plus project, and we were producing St Helena's most comprehensive environment map showing the functioning of habitats in soil. So it was really about creating a habitat map and soil map of St Helena um, and understanding how that um, helped the environment work better. Um, I've given you those that slide before really, we were looking at the relationship between habitat soils and fresh water um, and how they could impact in the future and that's where SIMAP came in. For those of you who've never had the privilege of going to St Helena, this is what it looks like. It's the most extraordinary place. Um, it's just this massive volcanic rock in the middle of the South Atlantic. So you're going, you're flying over sea for about four hours and then there's suddenly this huge volcanic lump um, and most of the cliffs are about two or three hundred feet high um, and then as you come in from the cliffs you get this desert zone um, um, and beyond the desert zone you then go into a sort of temperate almost climate um, which looks like anywhere in Europe because uh, the in East India Company used to use St Helena as a stop-off point on their way to East India and so they just used to bring in whatever trees they thought so they chopped down all the native trees. This is a gum wood. Gum wood would have been quite extensive in this um, 
sort of desert zone <coughs> before it was chopped down or, or eaten by goats, which were left on the island as a food source. Uh, so um, you can see they've got somewhat of an erosion problem in the desert zone. And then right at the top, you're into cloud forest. And the thing with cloud forest is it's wet. <laughs> it's very wet. <laughs> Even if you see the top of the hill and you're down the bottom and you think, oh, let's drive up there now. By the time you get there, the clouds back down. Um, this was taken from the little flat I was staying in, um, in the capital of St Helena, looking um, northwards. And that's the steepness of the valley wall. And in fact, they have an early warning system um, about uh, rock slides. So there's an alarm. And if the rock slide alarm goes off, then you have to run into one of the hiding places so that you don't get smashed. So erosion is a huge issue for them. Um, and they had no very clear idea on how the soil and vegetation and water were interacting before the project. Um, some, one of the project products we produced was SIMAP for the island. Uh, this is the second iteration. The first iteration um, was scored by a stakeholder group um, it, for the island and this is the second iteration which they're really quite happy with. Again presenting it to the policy makers it just is evidence that they can use, they can see these high erosion risk areas. Um, you know, there's no surprise that these, this is the sort of valley side that we were looking at. Um, it's actually this one, this one's even worse, which is where their main industrial um, base is. Uh, this area here is the cloud forest at the top, this blue um, area which is still native vegetation, which is an extremely beautiful place. Um, here on these high erosion risk areas, uh, after the East India Company left, they decided to plant flax everywhere because they thought it would be a good crop. But actually flax is very bad for soil erosion. And now they've got the problem that flax is planted on 40 degree slopes, so they're having to work through that to re-vegetate it. Um, and so that's where our opportunity to manage erosion risk map comes in. So we've got the potential um, here in this zone with flax to manage it very carefully to plant the flax out and to re-plant um, sort of more native or cloud forest appropriate species. Um, because we did a soil sample survey with Aberystwyth University at the same time as we did our habitat map and um, field work, we had some soil stability scores actually taken um, using um, field te techniques and again that's a really useful um, quality assurance of, of, the, of the model and how they work. So that was St Helena where we were giving them evidence and we were giving them um, <coughs> maps to help them make policy and to help them um, manage their environment better. There's only two and a half thousand people live on St Helena. They all do, you know, work incredibly hard but there's only like two of them that do anything that we'd have a whole department on so this sort of evidence is invaluable. Case study three um, is very much looking at um, vulnerability to storm events in the Caribbean overseas territories. This was in two phases. We uh, were making a model that they could run using open source software to look at um, risks from hurricanes and um, storm events both from inland flooding and from storm surge. After we'd made the models, Hurricane Irma and uh, Maria hit last year, so we went back and QA'd the models. So you're thinking, what on earth does SIMAP have to do with Caribbean islands and this sort of risk? Well, it's absolutely crucial because small island states, particularly these Caribbean overseas territories, get 70% and over of their income through the tourism market, which depend on their beaches. Um, how does beaches um, equate to SIMAP? Uh, well, actually, changes in the coastal zone catchments and the dynamic of the environment really exasperate the risk of beaches disappearing. This was actually taken three years, four years ago before Hurricane Gonzales. Um, and um, the person, Alison, was standing in exactly the same position when she took this after Hurricane Gonzalo. So it's really significant what happens there. Why it matters is um, mangroves and native uh, habitat vegetation particularly have a strong role in protecting the shoreline. 
um, from wave ingress in large storm events. They have these very um, complex root systems that go down, um, and as the wave velocity... Oh, you're filming. Never mind, I'll be a wave velocity. <laughs> as the wave velocity comes, it hits all these roof structures. Um, it just takes all the energy out. So by the time you get in land, um, you, all the energy's gone out of your, um, your wave. Why does SIMAP matter? Well, actually, if you, feel, if you feed mangroves beautiful, nutrient-rich water um, full of sediment from your development in land, they don't grow that sort of root. They just grow as nice, ordinary trees with nice, fleshy leaves. So you lose quite a lot of advantage of your mangrove. Furthermore, if you feed that lovely nutrient-rich um, water onto your coral reefs, the algae um, and seaweed think, yes, food, and just swamp the place. The reefs die, the next storm comes in, the reef structure isn't strong enough to stand it, and all you get is coral rubble. So instead of having a nice reef um, to stop your wave um, and to break it sooner before your island, you have coral rubble which doesn't do the job nearly so well. So actually, inland development and pollution is really important on the islands. What did we do? We purchased the World DEM radar satellite model. This is British Virgin Islands. For any of you who've been here, this is Tortola. So this is very different to um, the Anguilla example on the last slide because this is volcanic and it's very high and, and rocky. Um, this is the um, storm channels um, where the, ch the channels where water either does flow or would flow in storm events. They do have fresh water on Tortola and like Anguilla. Um, and um, we then created a habitat map um, based on um, a habitat map that they'd had previously um, and looked at the habitat structure. Um, so we ran it through, we ran SIMAP through first time as is with the habitat map that we created which was before the two hurricanes, and this is what you get. So you get patches of erosion risk. Um, some of them are very well known. Um, there's a road near that um, uh, gully there that's um, well, very similar to what we were seeing in the Lake District, really, uh, as a big erosion risk. What happened to the poor British Virgin Islands last year was Hurricane Irma came through and it took every single leaf off every single tree in the whole island. So then you run the model again saying what happens if you don't have any vegetation and your erosion risk changes to this. Um, and then they got hit by Maria and this is their erosion risk. And in fact, um, the BVI stakeholder group suggested that inland flooding was more costly to infrastructure and the environment than the storm surge in the island. Um, the sediment just built up. The um, drainage into the sea uh, some time to be stopped and wasn't very adequate to deal with that huge amount of sediment that came off. Um, so using SIMAP to help uh, inland flooding models um, by intersecting concavities with drainage channels actually is proving a huge value to them, again giving them evidence for decision making. When we were in the meeting when I was presenting these maps, one of the fire brigade was there and he was absolutely over the moon because he could go back to his chief of fire brigade and say, it is not sensible to position our fire engine here because it's in one of these high risk zones. Um, and before the hurricanes, uh, he, he, you know, they just positioned it there because they always had. And that fire engine was then completely out of the picture for the two <coughs> weeks of the storm. So very important stuff. <coughs> we took it a phase uh, further in um, Anguilla. Anguilla's completely different to Tortola. It's flat as pancake, um, limestone rock, no um, standing fresh running water at all. It's all aquifer. But it has um, drainage channels that run in these storm events. And we modeled two different scenarios here. This is what would happen if you had a degraded environment um, in terms of the pathways and where the sediment's going to be collected from. Um, and these sediment channels actually feed onto the reefs, which provide quite a lot of protection. On the other hand, if you were to plant um, vegetation in the most sensible places and actually make an effort to keep these channels um, uh, to, to the best of their ability to stop the sediment, then you get a very much um, reduced erosion risk project. So this um, 
these maps were presented to the government to give them evidence about how they wanted to take their environment plan forward in the future. So my conclusion, SIMAP is, um, well the outputs of SIMAP are really easily understood by policy makers, they get it. it. It equates to how they see their country, so they have a certain amount of surety in the land. And because it's a map and because it's a well-established model done with a sound scientific background, you can say to them, you know, this risk model is kosher, and they can then use that in policy. It really does address issues relevant to policymakers from Wales right over to the Caribbean, and it's usable at a range of scales and countries and scenarios. And that's me.